what's up everybody welcome back to the channel it's your girl colors and i'm back with another video and today's video is gonna be my labor and delivery story i really wanted to do this video just to give a background to everything that has happened so it's been a little while since i had baby nala it's been about six weeks so I just thought I should hurry up and get this video out of the way before I start forgetting things. If there's something that I miss in my story time, just make sure you comment your questions down below and I'll surely answer them the best I can. So yeah, without further ado, let's just go ahead and jump right into it. So I think the most proper way to start off this video is starting from the midwife's brew and what happened with that situation because uh that kind of happened abruptly and then next thing you know i'm in labor so let me start from there it was like 11 o'clock at night so at this point i was uh 36 and six days you'll notice in the video i did talk about how i already got the approval i was already one centimeter dilated at this point and we were so close to the 37 week mark i was like cool i was on my way to being induced anyway really soon and i didn't want that to happen so i was like you know what i'm gonna do the mint weiss brew so i got all the ingredients and took the drink the drink isn't nasty it's just different but you have to drink so much after drinking the drink i started feeling the contractions and then my stomach started hurting and i started to get this nauseated feeling so in my mind i was like you know what it's not gonna work i threw everything up there's no way that this could work so i just went to bed because at the end of that video clearly i was really sad because i really wanted this to work so the next day i ended up waking up and decided to make it again because the first one clearly is not gonna work you know i drank it i threw it all up it's not gonna work so i ended up making it again and i drank about half and i was like no i can't this is too i don't like the taste it's just it's just not it's it, when you try it when it, if you do try it you'll be like it's not that bad and it's really not but it's something about it that just makes it hard now i don't know if it's for me it could have been a tea because i don't like tea at all i have never tried a tea that i like not a green tea not lipton tea um I'm decent with brisk iced tea, but I don't like tea. So I don't know if it was that and the smell of that that could have rubbed me the wrong way. But after taking that, I was like, no, absolutely not. And I was like, you know what? What I should do is take half, half a teaspoon of castor oil and a little bit of juice probably like a half a cup of juice to substitute for the other half of the midwife root that I didn't drink you know so that's what i did and this was probably around 11 o'clock in the morning that i did this and i just went about my day after that i decided that i wanted to go to the florida state fair because you know i want to eat the food i was an interesting ride i came there for a list of food that i wanted to try and by this time it was probably about six o'clock because my husband gets off of work at five and we were meeting each other at the Florida State Fair. So we get there, we're there probably about, I would say two and a half hours, three hours, something like that. And my back is killing me. I'm doing walking all around the State Fair. The State Fair is big. So we're walking back and forth, finding different vendors to eat at. All I remember is we decided to leave. I'm walking out in the parking lot to get to the car. And I'm like, you know what, I can't. So I decided to get in his car for like 30 minutes and just rest my back. Just rest, rest, rest. At this time it was like, I don't know, maybe about nine o'clock or something like that. I get in my car, I drive home, we're home. I stayed there for a little minute. I ended up resting and I had to pick up my sister from the airport. So I ended up going to the airport at around 12 o'clock. We ended up getting home about 1.36. I went to bed, no issues. At 3.50 in the morning, I ended up getting woken up by my back aching and for some odd reason you know that bubbly feeling that you get in your gut when you're about to start your period so i went to the bathroom sat there for a minute 
feeling this feeling and I'm just like, I don't know what this is about, but maybe if I go pee, maybe it's that I gotta go pee and push out this feeling. This was my mind. So I went to the bathroom, I pee, everything normal. I wiped and I got up. Then something told me to sit back down and try to pee again. So when I peed the second time, I felt warm, like it was really warm. And I'm like, why my pee feels so warm? So I end up taking a tissue and wiping myself. Still kind of urinating, but when I wiped and I picked it up, I saw dripping blood all on <laughs> the tissue. I looked down in the toilet and I'm like, damn, I think it's time because it wasn't a little bit of blood, it was a good amount of blood. So I end up yelling out to David and I'm like, David, and he's like, what? And I was like, I think it's time. So I got up out the toilet and he came and looked at it and he was like, okay, let's get packed. I'm like, I literally just did a hospital bat video and my stuff that I did was still in the corner that I filmed the video in and I didn't repack it inside the bag. It was just scattered all over the place. So I just told him to get all the stuff that's inside um, that area and just put it in the bag. So once I'm getting off the toilet, I get to like the door of the bathroom. And as soon as I get through the door of the bathroom, a contraction hits me like a ton of bricks. And I just sat there and I remember going, ah, ah. <laughs> I was like, ah. Because it was so painful that I couldn't ignore it. That first one ended up lasting maybe about all of 20 seconds. And then I walk a little bit further away and then it hits me again. And Dave was like, oh no. Oh no, we gotta go to the hospital. <laughs> and I'm, I'm telling you, I'm trying to make my way to the bed and every time I walk a little bit further, I'm getting hit by contraction, contraction, contraction. Now, people will ask me all the time, like, what does a contraction feel like? If I could describe it. What they say about it being like a period is true. It's definitely true, but it's a, it's a period times 10. Now, when I say it's like a period, basically think of the back cramps that you get during a period and the pelvic pains that you get during a period. So think of all that pelvic and back pain. It wasn't much vagina feeling, but that cramp that you feel in, in your hip and pelvic area in your back. Imagine that cramp, your worst cramp that you ever felt and times that by 10. <laughs> that is a contraction. It is terrible. I blame the devil and I really do. Like it's Lucifer himself. What ended up happening was I had a contraction every three minutes lasting at least 45 seconds. From the time that basically, I don't know if I specified that, but basically what happened when I was bleeding in the toilet, my water broke. It was like a movie, so I pretty much left the bathroom, walk into my computer, telling myself, I gotta post this I'm a neighbor video. Because I created this video, this video is gonna go out. That is real love. That is love because I was thinking about you guys while I'm over here in labor. So after that, he woke up my sister and my niece because that's who was basically helping me prep for the baby. They went to go try to put the car seat in the car because we never did it. We wanted to film a video about putting the car seat in the car and we never got around to it. So they're in there trying to figure out how they eventually get it. They gather all the stuff and they put everything in the car. We hop in the car, it's roughly about roughly it's roughly about 4 40 in the morning i would say and we made it to the hospital so we get there it's probably around five o'clock we check in into the emergency room emergency room takes me to labor and delivery labor and delivery um end up checking me which is one thing i didn't realize what would be annoying so i'm in triage and I'm having contractions continuously. They're asking me all these questions. I'm trying my best to answer them. They're telling me, breathe. And I never realized that would be so annoying until I was experiencing it. I was in there like, and all they tell me is, 
Don't hold your breath. Breathe. Breathe slowly and control breathing. You don't know how annoying it is for somebody to tell you how to breathe when you're in pain. Even though it's understandable, they were like overbearing about it. Like every single time I had a contraction and I was trying to like brace myself with the contractions, they would just tell me to breathe. Matter of fact, breathing <laughs> did not help that pain. Um, let me tell you that right now because my whole goal going into labor and delivery, I was gonna do hypnobirthing, it's all in my head, no absolutely not it was in my back in my pelvis that's what it was i couldn't ignore it i couldn't adjust it so all i remember is them sticking a q-tip up me just to make sure that my water didn't break they keep it in there for roughly about a minute and then they take it out take it to the lab to see if it broke basically they came back confirmed that it was indeed broke and that they will be sending me to my room, which I would have Nala in. As soon as I got to triage, they, when they checked me and confirmed that my water broke, basically they said that I was three centimeters dilated. And I was probably in that room maybe about an hour. They transported me to my room. I changed into my labor and delivery gown, which you would see. They checked me again, and I was three to four centimeters dilated. So at this point, it's moving. And they asked me if I wanted to have an epidural. And I said, yeah, I said, yeah, child. I know I said I want this whole natural journey and I wanted to have the birth center thing, but I am so happy I didn't because I know that they would have transported me to the hospital anyway because of how bad things were. My congestion was so bad, I said, yeah, I said, yeah, child, I'm not finna be dealing with this. So they gave me the epidural, which is the guy that you've seen in my video. He gave me the epidural, amazing, amazing, amazing. And then I started feeling good. They gave me icicles and I was good to go, child. I was dialing and everything. Now, from this point, everything is kind of a blur. So, I kind of specified in the video that things had went bad. Like, it was a terrible experience. You see in the video, I was crying. I was exhausted. I was in pain. So, my epidural did work from the first guy. But what ended up happening was I got the popsicles, I got the epidural, and then I rested for a couple of hours. Nobody specified to me that I had to keep my epidural going to continue to not feel the pain. So they came in, I told them about it, that I was still in pain, and they told me about the button. I started feeling the button. Every 20 minutes is what you can press the button for. After you press it one time, the button's locked, so it won't let you pump anymore within that 20 minutes. So I pressed the button, and then I did that maybe for an hour. And I was like, it's not working. I still feel the pain. I can still move my feet. I can, you know, walk to the bathroom. Like, I'm still good. So by this time, they brought this lady into the room who was the anesthesiologist that I guess was taking over for the other guy. And I'm telling her, you know, yo, I'm still in a lot of pain. I can still feel my feet, I can walk, you know, everything is still not good. So she tells me basically that it's a difference from pressure and pain. So basically she was telling me that I wasn't feeling pain. So what started happening, which was weird, was I could feel most of the contractions, but some contractions I couldn't feel. So sometimes when she would come in, she would see like I was having the contractions, but I was talking through them. And then other ones, I was in pain, and she would see both of them. So she thought that I was just full of shit, basically. Like, <laughs> that's the best way I can explain it. So after a couple of hours going by, every 20 minutes I'm still going through this, by this time I am exhausted and I'm frustrated. And I'm like, you know what? I called her back in the room and I'm like, yo i need the bag because i can see that the epidural medicine bag was empty so i called them and i'm like yo the bag is empty i need a new bag i'm still in pain so by this time she coming in she's frustrated and she's basically telling me that she's not gonna give me the epidural for some reason i didn't understand this i'm like no like 
you have to give me more medicine like it's not working and she was like you're you're I, there's nothing else i can do for you basically and this is where you saw the video where i was crying and frustrated with everything and i did that whole little speech thing basically what happened was she ended up going out of the room and went to the other nurses that was out there to tell them that she gave me the epidural but i'm still having a problem with her so I look over to my doula and I'm like, Mama doula, this can't be life. This can't be life. I can still feel my feet. I can still move them. And she's asking me to move them. I'm moving them around. I'm picking them up. I'm lifting them. If I had an epidural oh, several hours ago, maybe about seven hours by this time, I shouldn't be able to do this thing. So I wanted to prove to everyone that I wasn't tripping. I literally stood up by myself with the epidural so at this time i'm getting back in the bed and the doctor is telling all the other nurses that i'm creating other problems so they decide to come in the room to i guess check me and at this time i'm like on my hands and knees trying to sit up straight and they come in the room and like no 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 you can't do this with an epidural we're gonna talk about this and <laughs> i had i had to be in pain because ain't they had me at the right moment. So when they was like, no, you can't do this. You can't be sit standing, you got an epidural. We're gonna have a conversation because you can't be doing this and this and that. I'm like, if I had an epidural, I shouldn't be able to be doing this. He's like, let's talk about this or whatever. So pretty much they end up kicking all my people out or whatever and trying to talk to me about everything. And I said, they can leave. I was like, you guys, you can leave because you're not gonna mess up my vibe and you're killing my vibe. I'm telling you that I have these issues. I shouldn't be able to do these things and you're worried about the other thing. And then it was like, well, she gave me the epidural, so what's the problem? I was like, she didn't tell me that she gave me the epidural. I was asking for an epidural and she had a problem. And I don't know if there's a language barrier because she was born <laughs> basically i felt she wasn't really understanding what i was saying and she took that at a different way so me and the two nurses and my husband and the doula are talking or whatever and then there i don't remember everything that was said but they're calming down because i told them i was like y'all need to calm down because i'm in labor and y'all shouldn't be talking to me like that and then i just basically told them i need a minute I was like, y'all can leave. So they end up leaving and that's when I created that video. And then after the video, they came back in, pretty much said, let's talk about it. I told them what my issues was. They ended up trying to give me another epidural. Everything was kind of a whirlwind, but that's basically what the gist of it. So I spent basically another four or five hours trying to cope with the pain as you can see in my labor and delivery video the pain never stopped and i never really truly got rest you know at one point you would see that it seemed like i was okay because we were talking about i was basically six minutes six centimeters dilated and basically what happened was um the other guy who originally did my epidural ended up coming back and giving me an epidural and it went smooth, it was fine, the pain went away, that's when I was talking. It seemed like every time she was there is when I had the issues. So that ended up going away because again, every time that I had the epidural, I fell asleep and I would wake up to the pain. So if I could give any advice to someone, if you have an epidural, um, make sure that your spouse, your family member or something, they have a duty of hitting that button every 20 minutes, even if you're asleep, so that you could always be medicated. For the amount of times I pressed that button, I should have been like a slug, like basically can barely move anything. So basically, there was like another five or six hours that went by, I didn't dilate at all because I was so stressed out. And basically one thing I found out is that when you're stressed out, your body can build centimeters again. So basically if I'm four, six centimeters dilated and I'm stressed out, I can go back to like a four. But I didn't dilate for like five hours. And then for some reason I felt 
like I was wet. By this time I had a catheter in and I felt like I could pee outside the catheter, which I did actually. That's a whole nother thing. But for some reason I felt really wet and it wasn't down there. So I looked behind me and I'm like, why is my back wet? Am I peeing up my back? Like, I just wasn't getting it. So I turned over to Mama Dula and I'm like, am I wet? I could end up sitting up and lifting my gown and there was like a wet spot on my gown, but it was colorless. So we was like, what's up with that? It wasn't blood or anything like that. So we ended up calling the nurses back into the room and we're like, hey, you know, she's wet. Can you come change her? So when the nurses came back into the room, they noticed basically the tubing to the epidural that was connected to my back, that was connected to the medicine. There's like a, a latch or something, I don't know. But for whatever reason, the latch broke and was pouring down my back. So at some portion, basically, I'm guessing that's the reason why the guy stopped working because um, the latch broke. Then the nurse called the anesthesiologist back, which was the lady that I did not like, and another fiasco started. We started getting back into it. She started to blame me. She goes like this. Imagine when she comes in, she was like, hold on, what's she at? This is my camera battery. She's holding the tube, tube in like this, and she's like, in 20 years of my experience, I have never seen this broke. This is very durable. And she's like, like this, this is very durable and I'm not understanding how this broke. I'm like, what are you saying to me now? Because really you're not selling, saying anything to me. By this time, my family's getting into it with her. They're going after her, they're like, that's why she's not working. If you listen to the video, you'll hear my godmother saying like, how is it, how is it broke or something like that? So they're getting into it with them. I'm getting into it with them. I'm getting overwhelmed with frustration, pain, and just sadness that this is my life right now, that I'm trying to have a baby. And it seems like since the moment I got here, it's been issues. At this point, I am like nine centimeters dilated. And she's like pretty much acting like there's nothing she can do for me. And I'm like, can you not just do it? I don't know why you keep holding this in my face. like. No one told me to be careful. She was like, no, you don't have to be careful, but this has never broke. I'm like, well, it broke today. I don't know what to tell you. She was like, do you want another epidural? I'm like, yeah, I want another epidural. And they're like, okay, well, let's get set up. All your people gonna have to leave. I said, I'm totally fine. They can leave, child, they can leave. So they left. Then we end up going to get this other epidural, child. This was the worst ever. My my contractions are spiking to like the hundreds still every two to three minutes at this point so she's hiking me up they put me up on the bed holding a pillow like this and waiting for the epidural to come in child she's placing this thing in my back or whatever she's doing her little thing and i'm crying i am bawling at this point i am bawling contractions are hitting we're probably there five minutes late. It was taking so long for her to do this epidural, so long. She does it and basically almost completes and pretty much tells me that she messed up, that she has to redo the epidural all over again because I felt the medicine pouring down my back. And I'm just like, oh my God, I can't believe this. This is my second epidural and she messed up and got to do it a third time. So I just started bawling, crying all over again. Mind you, this whole time I'm still having contractions every couple of minutes. So every time it comes, it's like, um, I have to not move because I can paralyze myself. She does it again, I guess it works or whatever. And we let everyone back in the room. She leaves, go about her way. And I'm just like, there's nothing I can do. I'm just gonna have to bear this situation at this point. 
So I'm bearing it or whatever. Everyone come back in. And then the lady comes in, checks me. I'm nine and a half centimeters dilated. She tells me at this point, <laughs> which is so annoying. And if you're going in labor, they might rely on you to tell them when you are ready to push. And that part I had no idea about. I thought that they're gonna check me, I'm 10 centimeters dilated, and they're gonna tell me, okay, we can start pushing now. That's not what happened. She said I had a little bit of a lip left, but I'm almost done. But she told me that, hey, let me know when you're ready to push. And I'm just like, what? She's like, yeah, just let me know when you're ready to push. And you'll know when you're ready to push because that baby will sink, sink into there and you just cannot bear it. At this time, it's probably like 11, 30, 12 o'clock or whatever. And I'm just like, okay, I don't know when I can't bear it no more. Mind you, even though I'm going through, at this point, almost 21 hours labor at this point, bearing through pain. I don't know how I'm gonna know the difference, but you know, whatever. So I'm sitting there and my doula's like, I think you're ready to push. I'm having contractions. I'm going through the contractions. I've been having the same reaction that I've been having the whole time, but I don't feel no different. I don't feel like it's unbearable. So we sit there another hour and then another like 30 minutes go by. There was a shift in a feeling down there where I felt like the baby engaged down in there. And at that point I had to like, sit on the edge of the bed, but I didn't feel like, oh my God, let's push it out. I just felt like her sunken into place. I'm still going through the motions. My dude was like, uh, you, you, you gotta push. Let's just push. So we're having this secret conversation between me and her. And she was like, how about this? When you feel those contractions, push a little bit. And I'm like, you sure? She's like, I, I think you're ready to push. And then she decides to just call the nurse, tell them to come on or whatever. And then everything from that point was a whirlwind. So the nurse checks me, tells me I'm 10 centimeters dilated and that she can see the baby's hair. And I'm just like, oh, thank God. So she turns on this light. The light is from Jesus himself because that light was so bright, I couldn't see nobody. Like nobody, that light was so bright. So she's telling me to push, I'm pushing. And one thing I love that she did though, the nurse, she stuck her finger on my vagina and put it to a pressure point and was like, you feel this? And I said, yeah, she was like, wherever you feel that finger, push. Oh my God, that has helped me so much in the pushing process. I knew how to push when she did that. All in all, I started pushing and she calls the doctor in to get everything set up. People start going in. The nurse tells, hey, like, hey, is all these people staying in the room? I'm like, yeah. So they stand in the room. I already told them how to stand. I told them, yeah, all these people stand in there. And then it was time to push. So I pushed all in all for about 30 minutes and I can tell you when it comes to pushing the worst part of pushing is literally having enough lung capacity to hold my breath because they'll tell you like hey this one contraction coming up you push and you push as hard as you can without trying to overly push if that makes sense. Even though it sounded like in the video that I was, but I really wasn't. It was really just me holding my breath until I couldn't hold it no more. But it would be three contractions and I have to hold my breath as long as I can per contraction. And that was the toughest part, not the pushing. I never felt the ring of fire. It was literally only holding my breath to push her out. That was the problem. <laughs> <laughs> which was very comforting because I thought it was gonna be way worse. Honestly, the worst part of labor and delivery is the contractions. If you go through that fast, you will literally have an easy labor and delivery. So we push for 30 minutes, baby Nala pops her head out and the lady tells me, the doctor, she's like, stop pushing, stop, stop, stop pushing. 
and which I found out later is the cord was really wrapped around her neck. So when she came out, she was almost kind of purple. And I didn't really see her. I just know that when she told me to stop, like the whole room got silent. And she cuts the umbilical cord. She pulls out Nala and places her on my stomach. Well, on my chest. And I look at her and I remember touching her thinking that she was extremely light. So I was, remember trying to touch her and she wasn't crying. And then the nurses were over her on my chest and she's still not crying. So she picks her up, takes her away to the warmer and they start doing their thing. David's still by the bed looking at me and I'm just like, go. I remember it felt like forever and I'm sitting there and like, is she okay? And I'm asking, is she okay? Cause she still hasn't cried yet. And they're like, she's fine, she's fine. And I'm like, she's not crying. You know, where is that stereotypical cry that you always hear? It felt like still some time going by and then all of a sudden I heard a little like cry. But I remember thinking it was the most faintest cry, like she was struggling. That sucked, you know. I know that babies get the umbilical cord wrapped around them, but the way that she was sounding, it sounded bad, you know. She cried, and you can hear it. it's like very like blocked, very like she was almost like dying kind of cry. That's how it sounded like she was struggling, and they sat there, and that was the only cries maybe about three or four cries i heard and i ain't hear nothing else then they decided to bring her over and then she was really quiet uh i finally got to see her she was looking up at me and i felt just blessed you know that she was here and they're saying she's okay so she's okay you know she's fine and at that point it is 1 56 in the morning and they transport me to uh, recovery. So I get to recovery and I must have just passed out. I don't really remember what happened. I just remember waking up maybe about three in the morning to her crying. And now it's time to breastfeed. Now three something in the morning, they're teaching me how to breastfeed, which is very convenient. I really thought I was gonna try to breastfeed immediately, but they didn't have me breastfeed until hours later, and I thought that was weird, but. So now they're teaching me to breastfeed, and I remember thinking when she had clenched on, that was the most painful clench to my nipple I have ever felt in my life. She was literally chewing my nipple. That was so, painful and i remember that first suckle i was like i ain't gonna breastfeed i can't do it and i just kept fighting through it fighting through it fighting through it for hours so i fed her mind you ain't really nothing coming out at all but she is getting a little frantic because she's hungry and she's chewing down on my nipples she's sliding off the nipple my nipples are getting bruised and then she falls asleep. So we kind of go through this for maybe up until 12 o'clock. And then they come to talk to me about the potential of needing to supplement because she hadn't pooped. And basically that was the problem. They need her to poop because that's one of the requirements that you need to leave the hospital. And you as well. I had to use the bathroom, but I had to use the bathroom immediately almost. So... By the time I got to the room, I peed, they watched me, which I thought would have been a weird thing because they literally help you go to the bathroom. Like I'm on the toilet, she's like right there next to me on the toilet like this. I thought I was gonna feel weird about that, but I could care less to see my vagina at that point. <laughs> but anyway, going back to her, so they're telling me that she needs to use the bathroom. She hasn't yet. If she doesn't, by the time the 24 hour mark come, then 
I have to basically find a way for her to supplement. At this point, she, that person leaves and then another person comes up to me to talk to me about the whole jaundice situation. So they told me that she had high levels of jaundice and they believed that because she didn't have a bowel movement that she had jaundice and that's the reason why she was looking the way she was looking. So what they end up doing was they end up putting her um, a suppository of her butt to get her to poop which ended up working and her jaundice level went down a little bit basically that ended up help curing it but they wanted to make sure keep feeding her to keep getting the jaundice out I guess type of thing so yeah that is pretty much it um, the only thing that I could remember thinking inside of the hospital was that and this is to each its own if you're gonna supplement and you're gonna be in the hospital for a minute I would suggest I did personally donor milk but in hindsight I wish that I would have just did formula from the beginning because it was such a hassle trying to get them to give me the donor milk and as much as she was drinking when I started feeding her in the bottle they gave me 12 ounces of donor milk at a time but she was drinking way more than that so she would still go hungry and that was kind of a a problem because they give you all these statistics about oh the baby's stomach's this big so they're not gonna drink a lot but my baby was drinking more as a newborn newborn more than that and she was still hungry and it was just so much of a hassle trying to call them get them to get the donor milk to warm it up to give it to you it was just it was just a lot like a lot a lot and I wish I could just get the ready to drink formulas that they give you in the hospital. I would have saved a lot of time because then they'll give you like a bunch of milk at one time and you feed her as she wants it. But yeah, basically all in all that is my labor and delivery story. I feel like I am missing some key points or whatever but that is basically the gist of what is going on a lot of people are asking me would i try for baby number two anytime soon and the answer is maybe <laughs> maybe so david actually wants to have a kid and start trying within six months and he is ready just to get through it and i have a lot of mixed feelings like uh i am ready for a potential another baby but at the same time I think that's mainly because of the difficulties that I had in having uh, the first baby and I know the stereotype of oh you're all fertile and this and that and you can get pregnant really quickly and this and that but throughout my whole labor and delivery in pregnancy I have not been a part of any textbook statistics all mine was abnormal so it's hard for me to believe that i'm just gonna be 100 percent fertile just because of statistics also because of my tremor issues and health and getting older um we all in all wanted three kids and it's scary of the thought of trying to have kids soon but because of all the issues that i have i feel like we would potentially start soon preferably a year but i'm not gonna prevent it either so yeah um that is all and if you have any questions just comment down below but if you haven't already please make sure you like this video subscribe to the channel turn on your post notifications and i will see you guys in the next one 